Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers, uh, Misha and Frédéric, for including me in this uh, opportunity to explore some really deep questions surrounding death uh, that I believe uh, allow us to get to the core of our humanity. I'm honored to be here, and I am looking forward to the presentations and discussions that will follow today and tomorrow. And given that this is a transdisciplinary um, conference, I want to start out by stating the obvious, but I believe nevertheless important premise for my talk today. I'm an archeologist working mostly with prehistoric people. And this means that my sources consist of the materialized remains of past people's actions. The traces of what people did in the past, and in my case, how they treated their dead. I don't have access to interviews, rarely to written accounts, and as you will see in this talk, my guiding principle is that we can get a lot of insight into what matters to people in a deep way by engaging with what they do, practically and materially, to structure and make sense of their world. Another source for my work are also the physical remains of the bodies themselves. I believe that in the case of understanding death, the materiality of the body is a key component that allows us to approach this issue, such as uh, this issue um, uh, beyond, beyond just the skeletal remains. We get at beliefs about life and death, the body and the self, but also symbolic dimensions, interpersonal relations, feelings, grief, loss, and concepts of dignity, which are at the center of, of this conference. All of this, I believe, bring us closer to the humanity of the past. Our focus here is on the dignity uh, and dignity and death. How do we treat the dead with dignity? And the scope is broad, and, I can, uh, and it can be approached in different ways. My contribution will focus on understanding what treating the dead with dignity might mean from a very universal perspective. In other words, what is it about the dead that demands dignity? Why is dignity important? What can this look like across times, space, and cultures? And can we, in the midst of this immense diversity that presents itself, find a core that we all can relate to in a basic way? I believe this core is important because it constitutes a form of common denominator that allows us to see ourselves in the other, the other in ourselves across cultural difference. So if we get to that point, we can also find ways to negotiate across these cultural differences, as for example, regarding the topic that we explored like last night, which uh, kind of confronts very different cultural ways of, of perceiving uh, the uh, exhibition of human remains. Uh, and I believe that it provides a sensitivity that just allows us, allow us to uh, meet with one another in these difficult discussions. So my point of departure, placed on the human body and how it's handled practically through ritual and what that means. And while I'm speaking on that, um, wait, no. Okay, I was supposed to get up a little trigger warning here, so you just imagine it. While I'm speaking on this, I want to communicate to you that my presentation will include uh, images of human remains in some cases. Uh, and so I want to just address that uh, right now um, and communicate that I am aware, of course, that not everybody is comfortable with this, and I recognize that. But I do include them here to provide a basis of understanding for my argument, and I hope you will agree with me that it is not sensationalist or voyeuristic. In this talk, I will start by talking about death as a universal human crisis and place the human cadaver at the center of that crisis. I will then speak of the structure of ritual, what it does to people involved with them, and why we need them. And then I will discuss the importance of mortuary ritual as a strategic way to act in times of crisis, and place the practical treatment of the dead body at the center of those uh, practices as a materialization of death, and as a locus around which humans take and can make sense of death, perform it, and achieve a sense of control over it. I will then give a few archaeological examples 
Uh, and finally, circle back to uh, what this all means in order to contribute to a sense of deeper understanding of the human condition in the face of death. <coughs> when a human being dies, very basically, two things occur. A social being disappears and a cadaver emerges. Both these cause a form of crisis that is experienced by humans across times and cultures. And the response to this shared experience, however, are incredibly diverse and framed within a cultural structure. What does this mean? The social being, that person that used to be alive, have relationships with others, responsibilities, roles, perhaps property, that being is gone and that leaves a tear in the social fabric. Grief and mourning must be given a form for expression, but practically roles and responsibilities must also be redistributed. These transitions are necessary for the community to move on from the loss and for life to eventually continue. Most research on death in my field, archaeology, has focused on this dimension. Death is seen as a source to understand who the dead was in life. Death itself is not as central to burial archaeology as people might think. The emergence of the cadaver, what is left behind on that bed, is much less central in this research. In my work, however, that focuses more on how people in the past handled death itself. I have framed it as absolutely central, and I will explain why. The body and the self, and by that I mean that social being we just talked about, are completely entangled. At death, they become partially, but not necessarily wholly disentangled. One aspect of this are the physical changes. Almost immediately after death, the body will start to break down through processes that will dramatically alter its appearance. While we all know that the body is shaped by culture, uh, it is also a biological entity. And at death, this biological entity will take over. Culturally learned practices shape the body and are given expression through the way we talk, the, uh, the way we move, it, the way we affect its appearance, and in this way, the self and the body are linked in life, and in turn, both are entangled with culture by the engagement th that we have with our body to norms and expectations. We can call this the mindful body and the embodied mind. At death, this relationship breaks down. The body can no longer be controlled by the internal and encultured self. It will start to bloat, to change color, to leak, to rot, to smell, to decompose, unless some form of cultural control is imposed, but this time not from within, but from the outside by the survivors. This, these controlling actions are what the mortuary practices basically are, and they are carried out by the living. The psychoanalyst, philosopher, and linguist, uh, Julia Christeva, has talked about the cadaver as the ultimate abject, which, in her, which is her category of something that is suspended between subject and object thereby challenging fundamental categorizations of human culture. This fits exceedingly well when we try to understand the complexity of the human cadaver. It is both subject and object, no longer alive, but still re retaining some of that person it used to embody. It still looks like it, although perhaps it looks a little bit more like Lenin now. Being suspended, no longer and not yet classified, to use the definition by uh, anthropologist Victor Turner, this makes the cadaver distinctly liminal on the boundary of culturally significant categories. In Kisteva's work, as well as in Turner's and Mary Douglas's, these liminal and abject phenomena create contradictory responses in us. They are threatening us, yet attracting us. They are disgusting, yet alluring. They're powerful and helpless. The dead body is not only an object of horror or dread, but also har uh, a harbor for projected emotions of love, care, maybe even desire. The abject quality of the cadaver is thus a powerful symbol in itself. So it's not the association to death that makes the cadaver into a liminal abject and hence potentially dangerous. It is the fact that it embodies a tr transgression of fundamental social categories the fact that it can be perceived as both alive and dead. Or as Kisteva said, it's not the absence of purity, but the fact that it disturbs order that gives it this character. And of course, folklore is rich 
of examples of the power and allure of the transgressive categories between life and death, like zombies, ghosts, etc. The second and partly linked dimension of this has to do with the relationship between the body and the self at the juncture between life and death. The cadaver still partially looks like the person, the, uh, the person and the body that, that it used to embody, but something very tangible has happened. And here is in this um, series of watercolors, which is uh, a Japanese watercolors that tells the story of, of the death and decomposition of this uh, woman. Here we can see her in life. And we think back at those images before. The body is both and no longer that person. But then what happens to the relationship that we have with the body and the living that used, what happens like with our relationship with the cadaver? As we still are retaining the memory of the person that it used to embody and still kind of look like, looks like. So how does this all relate to mortuary ritual? And where does it, the concept of dignity come in? A dead human body is not a neutral object. It's not thrown out with the trash. The handling of the dead body is almost always ritualized. And through the practical engagement with a cadaver, humans work through the stages of loss and grief. A ritual time that also can be linked to solving other issues, such as reallocations of roles and responsibilities that we talked about at the beginning. It's around the treatment of the dead body that death is handled, even controlled through performances that make it acceptable. And, it's a and in the process, the living also separate from the dead body in one way or another. So it's through the practical engagement, the handling of the cadaver, that we start to redefine the dead body into something from which we can separate. The ways in which this is done varies greatly from culture to culture. We know both from the ethnographic and archaeological record that the possibilities are almost endless when it comes to the treatment of the dead body, from inhumation to cremation, mummification, cannibalism, incorporation and display of the putrefaction of and decomposition processes, performative destruction of the body, burials in multiple stages, and on and on. The rich variation in ritual practice is linked to the fact that practices deployed to handle the cadaver must be connected to the broader cosmology. They must fit into uh, the worldview of the people that need this process to, to, uh, to, to kind of uh, um, handle the death. And that means that it needs to be connected to myths and knowledge about life and death, the body, personhood, and so on. And those will be culturally specific and in turn connect to broader webs of cultural structures. So through these practices, the abject cadaver is handled, uncontrollable death is controlled, order is imposed, and death is produced in a manner that makes sense, is culturally acceptable, and fits into the overall cosmology. And when we look at ritual theory, particularly rites of passage, we can see that rituals are used to define a range of fundamental and social and cultural categories, often in order, in order to make the transition from one to the other possible. For example, the transition from married to, uh, or from unmarried to married, from child to adult, etc. And in order to make the transition possible, the ritual always also kind of reaffirms what the categories themselves are. So you kind of play up the categories, what is it to be alive, what is it to be dead, what is it to be married, and what is it to be unmarried, for example. Um, you clarify what they stand for, and then you open up a connection between the two. So for example, a child could be, the social role of the child could be irresponsible, and the role of adult is responsible, or the single person is allowed to have multiple partners, a married person must be faithful, and so on. So. Um, Like other rites of passage, the process tends to include a significant phase of liminality, where normalcy is suspended, social structure is inverted, a period of chaos, or just kind of outside of, of, of normalcy, that plays out the contradictions in order to mark the categories. And when we talk about mortuary rituals in our culture, that would be the grieving period, which is marked off as different, when we're not expected to interact with people in the same way as, as we would otherwise. Uh, so an example of this would be, for example, a bachelor or bachelorette party, which is integrated into a sequence of wedding rituals. It is a limited period of transgression that makes the distinction between being single and being married for the last time 
a night out with the guys or the girls, etc. It's a performance. It's often an, it's a performance of an exaggerated version of what cultures associate to bachelorhood. We can call this out for sexism, heteronormativity, toxic masculinity, and so on and so forth. But my point is that the cultural this is a cultural mechanism that a surprising number of people adhere to. It is how culture works. It kind of plays out, it exaggerates a social state before it kind of takes the person who is getting married out of it into this new role. And for mortuary practices then, the presence of the abject cadaver is a similar kind of reminder. It too transgresses the fundamental boundaries of categories between life and death, object and subject. It constitutes a face on the transition from life to death. What is done to it, how it's ritualized and redefined connects to a range of cultural values embedded in the cosmology. So just like the bachelor at the height of performed debauchery ultimately is shaped into a responsible groom, so the abject cadaver must be shaped to embody a good death. Through the engagement with the cadaver, the survivors control and produce an image and an understanding of death more broadly. If we look closely at the materialized remains of these practices, the treatment of the dead body allows us insight into the structure of fundamental value systems, even for periods without texts, and that give us access to thoughts of people in the past. Placed within a frame of ritual theory that focuses on the importance of practice, so it is the physical engagement, the practical embodied engagement with these things that we do with the body, that are more important than the meaning ascribed or projected onto those practices. And here I build on the work by Catherine Bell, who in turn builds on Pierre Bourdieu. <coughs> the order imposed on the dead body by the surviving community consists of structured and structuring practices, things that we do both to give form to our cultural values and simultaneously reproduce them. These practices establish the boundaries between the categories that are culturally defined often as binary opposites. Alive, dead, dirty, clean, hot, cold, good, bad, raw, cooked, light, dark, child, adult, male, female, unmarried, married, and so on. And they in turn structure the world through a complex web of associations, passing through the complex systems of myth, metaphor, metonymy, indices, linking them to cosmolog cosmological order. So through these actions that the way in which we treat the cadaver, we kind of trigger these chains of association that binds whatever it is that we do to control death to bigger systems of overall meaning. And this, by the way, is true also for the problematic bachelor party. Through ritualization, certain acts become foundational in the reproduction of this cosmology. So in the case of mortuary rituals, the premise is that the liminal cadaver is handled in a way that allows it to become redefined into something from which the mourners can separate, and in a manner that the culture finds acceptable. So for example, the concept that the dead looks peaceful, that's something that we sometimes hear in our own culture, that signals ideas about what we want death to be, to be good, to be peaceful. But it can be a lot of other things, and the key is that it has to fit into this broader set of associations structure. And this is made possible through these embodied rituals, a practical handling of the cadaver that redefines its place and transitions it from life to death. And as archaeologists, we can study the materialized traces of the handling of the corpse through this lens and approach the belief systems that structured ideas about life and death in the deep past. When these ritual practices that carefully handle the body of the death are disturbed or interrupted or taken from the survivors by force or circumstance, the dignity of death is lost. And that causes or can risk causing unresolved grief and trauma. I'll return to this a little bit later. So finally, some archaeology then, as I promised. Uh, let's have a look at what archaeology can tell us about these processes and what, in return, that can bring us to broader explorations of uh, what we're discussing here. My early work focused on the understanding of death around 7,000 years ago, among the Stone Age hunter-gatherers of southern Scandinavia and eastern Baltic. Toward the end of the period that we called the Mesolithic, which is the hunter-gatherer Stone Age, 
Large concentration of burials start forming around the Baltic with several well-known examples in southern Scandinavia, in northern Poland, in the eastern Baltic, and Karelia. These cemeteries are often associated with occupation sites, so they bury their dead close to where we also know that they were living, at least part, partially. Uh, they're often close to water and possibly indicate a gradual process towards sedentism. People are kind of moving less in the, they're attaching themselves to places in the landscape. When these cemeteries were first studied in the 1980s, um, the variation in the mortuary practices was underscored. They were just like, oh, it's so strange, all these Stonish people, they're placing their dead on the stomach, on the back, sitting up, on the side, oh, there's lots of complexity. Um, and that be became immediately attached to concepts such as com complex societies. If people do s various things with their dead, certainly it must mean that they're sending us messages about differential status in the past. That was kind of the, the, the thinking. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, some people still saw, saw this as simple because they were basically just putting people in the ground. So, um, depending on wh what you thought was significant in terms of variation, people came down different sides of this. But what these contradictory approaches shared was a focus on what the burials could tell about the social organization of the living societies while overlooking their potential to inform us about the experience of death and ritual or overall cosmology in the past. How did these Stone Age people conceptualize death? That's what I'm interested in. My analysis placed the treatment of the cadaver at the center of the analysis, both methodologically and theoretically. The analysis showed that beyond the variation in the position of the body and the grave goods accompanying the dead, the mortuary practices on the treatment of the body were anchored in several norms that appear to have been almost non-negotiable. When things are non-negotiable, they're really important, I think. The bodies were, with a few exceptions, buried intact shortly after death and in lifelike positions. This is especially clear, as in the example here, where you have uh, a teenage boy holding a child in his arms. And sometimes they're also placed to look at each other, for example, in the grave. They were placed in pits dug into the ground that were immediately filled with sediment. In a few cases, there are indications that the body was placed inside a container, skin or bark, or in some cases, the body appears to have been placed on top of a platform or some other structure separating it from immediate contact with the bottom of the pit, as if to make it comfortable. So seen within a practice theory framework, the analysis emphasized the importance of making sense of these foundational and non-negotiable practices for the ritualization of the body and its place within a broader cosmology. So this norm emphasized care for the dead, displaying it as if it still retains some of its subjectivity. They are buried a little bit as if they're still a little bit alive. Um, not that that would be like a misunderstanding of sorts, but the way that death is staged, the, 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 the living person is still present. This is visible in the arrangement of the bodies, in their lifelike positions, the care and the comfort, and the arrangements of inner structures, in the gift giving, in the form of deposited grave goods. So the final view that the survivors would have had of their dead in these societies displayed a death that imitated life in a way in which the individual maintained its bodily integrity. With few exceptions, the final resting place for the dead was also respected. Uh, there are indications of disturbance and interference with the remains after deposition of the body, but they're rare. And in the rare cases when this disturbance has happened in prehistory, it seems to be quite unproblematic in the sense that there are no indications that it, there was any repair or um, intervention to fix it, which uh, might indicate that after or once the soft tissues have disappeared, um, the transformation of life from life to death was completed and the integrity of the body was no longer as central for the conceptualization of death. When placing these practices in a broader context, the norm appears to stress a particular category for human death. Human bodies were interred whole in lifelike positions, almost imitating life. And this is a stark contrast to animal bodies that would have been processed on a very regular basis by hunter-gatherers like these being partitioned after death, divided among people, and consumed 
While hunter-gatherer cosmologists often uh, character are characterized by an animist worldview where humans and animals are engaged in relationships that can be viewed as social rather than exploitative, human death was still treated very differently from animal death in these hunter-gatherer communities. It's notable that several dogs were buried among the humans, indicating a certain humanization of this domesticated animal, the species thus blurring the distinction between human and non-human animals. Within the mortuary practices, there are a few deviations from the norm that serve to highlight the tension within the burial program and that may indicate a certain fluidity in the categorization of the bodies. Here is one case from southern Sweden, Skotteholm, where a body was cut up in pieces and it's not complete. Uh, a hand and a foot is missing, for example, <clears throat> placed in some kind of container. This might have been a strategy to spare the, the onlookers uh, the participants in the ritual from an abnormal death. So they were hiding, kind of sparing, uh, reinforcing the norm to protect the dignity, perhaps, of the dead person. Or uh, it's equally possible that these treatments were carried out to recategorize the individual at death, perhaps treating it more like a non human animal to emphasize the fluidity of categories within a hunter gatherer cosmology. The occurrence of post depositional manipulation of the burials which can be seen in isolated cases, indicating that while the normative burial may be concealing decomposition, the processes were intimately known and could be exploited for ritual purposes. And so we do have cases, for example, of uh, bones being carefully removed from some of these burials. And the removal of bones from the graves could resonate with other experiences among hunter-gatherers, such as the caching of raw materials or other curating technologies to prepare raw materials by submersion or burial. Perhaps this pra practice brings together technological knowledge and experiences or raw material creation, landscape use, and the revisiting of significant places such as caches and burials, with belief systems about the transformation of the body and its shift from individual to ancestral essence in the ground, bringing it all together in practices that do not separate the ritual and everyday life, but rather blend them seamlessly into a coherent worldview. Now let's move on to more recent periods uh, and the work of other archaeologists. A similar use of practice theory and the treatment of the body after death can be found in the work uh, by Julie Lund um, in her work on the uh, archaeology of death during the conversion from Old Norse religion to Christianity during the Viking Age and early medieval period in Scandinavia. Here the focus is on a period of change in worldview how does the treatment of the body get negotiated in this transition, this conversion transition? What happened as people went from burying their dead, uh, burnt and fragmented, to moving on to interring whole bodies instead? Her approach centers ritual practice as driving the change rather than just expressing it. Uh, the changes she sees in the mortuary practices from the 9th to the 11th centuries were not, according to her, just a passive reflection of the conversion to Christianity, but instrumental in making the conversion. Here we can see just how enmeshed the cultural value system and the mortuary practices can be, and how synergetic the processes of change. Her work suggests that there was a parallel between the treatment of bodies and objects in rituals and in everyday life. This transition toward an emphasis on the whole as ideal indicated a deep change in mentality that extended beyond the religious life. What we take from this is yet again that death is important and the way we handle it must resonate throughout a whole culture. But things are not always harmonious. If at least, if at least most of the above mentioned cases are examples of how we think a good and, or dignified death was created through ritualized practices, providing survivors with an emotionally, socially engaging strategy to gain a sense of control over entirely natural, normal parts of the life course. Archaeology can also give us insight into what happens when mass death from epidemics, natural catastrophes, or violence strains the culturally structured ritual system. In such instances, the sheer number of deaths can make the traditionally prescribed ritual response difficult or even uh, impossible. But it goes beyond that. And to understand this, we can recall yet again how enmeshed the ritual response to death is with multiple other dimensions of cultural concerns and values. 
the abandonment of the dead, be it on the streets of New Orleans in the aftermath of Katrina in 2005, or on the streets of Bucha and elsewhere in the Ukraine after the Russian aggression and Sumerian killing of civilians, it hits us in a visceral way. We just know that there is something very wrong when people are not caring or able to care for the dead, when the dead are abandoned in the streets. Then we know that humanity and its many strategies to keep up culture and social contracts is deeply threatened. So if we go back to archaeology one more time, historic examples of crisis death from European plagues provide an insight into how societies negotiated the ritual response. And here I refer to the work by Bianucci and Kaki on plague-related graves in southern France. We tend to associate plagues with mass graves. In medieval Europe, mass graves were a dramatic break from the prescribed funeral rituals with single inhumations. With mass death, creating both a radically increased number of dead and simultaneously a society under enormous stress, mass graves became a necessary practical solution to an almost insurmountable problem. The great plague that ravaged Provence and Languedoc during 1720 to 22 claimed more than 100,000 deaths, approximately 30% of the population. Dozens, even hundreds of people died daily in Marseille alone. And under the circumstances, the dead were dumped in large pits and trenches that accommodated both, these, uh, both those who died in infirmaries and were buried shortly after death, and those who died elsewhere and were found hours or days later. Excavations have revealed details about the management of the dead body. The first category were given the burial according to imposed sanitary restrictions, undressed and wrapped in shrouds. The second category was buried fully dressed to minimize contact with their bodies. The details revealed by the excavations of these pits allow us to imagine the concrete work associated with preparing and transporting the corpses. It's likely that under the circumstances, the ritualized component of these were minimized. After all, the mass graves were a final resort. In fact, the archaeological record of the plague indicates that in the rural cemeteries, where the mortality in general was lower, the victims were often buried in individual graves, on the backs and with the head oriented east, reflecting traditional Christian funerary treatments. It was only after the transmission started to intensify that we see the, adop uh, the ad adaptation to accommodate handling increasing numbers of deaths, with first double graves and eventually mass graves. For our purposes here, it's interesting to reflect over the significant role the traditional burial practice might have played in villages and cities as the deadly infection started to sweep through them, causing death and creating suffering. The shift in the mortuary practices shows flexibility, but the attempts to hold on to the traditional practices as long as possible also demonstrate the significant roles these rituals must have played in comforting the community in this time of extreme adversity. The ability to continue providing the deceased with a prescribed burial may have allowed the survivors to hold on to the idea that this, that this death was still acceptable. In contrast, the transition to mass graves, even organized ones, can be viewed as a material manifestation of a society trying to hold on to its most basic principle of order while sinking into chaos as death becomes uncontrollable. And sometimes the handling of the dead is weaponized. In war and conflict, it's not uncommon that ritual or the withholding of it can become a form of violence. By denying one's dead enemies a prescribed burial ritual, or by using the bodies of the dead to make statements of power, the trauma of the violence and defeat can be prolonged among the living. An example of this kind of post-mortem violence can be found in the Bohemian stronghold of Bucek, uh, in the Czech Republic, where the mass graves close to the early medieval hill fort recorded the gruesome story of the treatment of the bodies of 60 soldiers who lost their lives um, in a massacre, sometimes between 930 and 990. And they were studied by Stefan and colleagues. The individuals were all young male adults, and their skeletons preserved perimortem fractures, evidence of violent deaths, mostly by sword. Many of them show sign of decapitation, often the result of multiple blows, so not a professional executioner. 
It's been suggested that the treatment of the bodies could be understood as a part of public performance where the bodies remaining unburied for some time with the skulls maintained as trophies or for display. And here the withholding of the usual mortuary ritual and in addition the added violence against the body can be viewed as compounding trauma for survivors and those close to the victims. From a perspective of dignity, this would be a concrete example of intentional reversal of that and to attach uh, to what we talked about yesterday with the uh, human remains in museums. We do have evidence of these kinds of heads taken, uh, for example, from, uh, from the Congo by the Belgian colonial power that are still in, um, that are still in, uh, in museum, in museum in Belgium. So that kind of gives a certain uh, uh, acuteness to the, the, the discussions, how we can kind of connect these uh, contemporary debates with very deep uh, historic evidence. Finally, evidence of abandoned slain bodies also occur in the archaeological record. On the battlefield in Kalkiza, uh, which is the assumed location for the Battle of the Teutoburger Forest in 9 AD, Archaeologists have found the remains of weapons, tools, personal equipment, and so on, but also human remains uh, that uh, were kind of deposited in uh, eight bone pits. The bones are weathered, indicating that they had laid on the ground for some time before burial. It has been proposed that the slain Romal soldiers were left on the battlefield only to be buried several years later. By the way, we can imagine what then, if that's the case, uh, what that place would have been like for the local population in terms of uh, sensory uh, experiences, but also kind of a place of horror and death. The written record by Tacitus reports that uh, Germanicus and his legions, quote, on the spot, six years after the disaster, in grief and anger, began to bury the bones of the three legions, not a soldier knowing whether he was interring the relics of a relative or a stranger, unquote. The interpretation remains contested since the bodies did not receive a treatment that would be typical for that of a Roman soldier, which would be cremation. But the remains have been treated with a certain respect, in particular the skulls. If Germanicus was indeed responsible for this burial operation, it would have been improvised to fit the unique situation with the ultimate goal of covering the dead with earth, according to Roman tradition. Again, we can see the pivotal role of ritual through a drawn out process where at first the dead are denied their usual non-negotiable mortuary ritual, prolonging the trauma of the defeat. Uh, and in this case, a Roman legion is mobilized to return years after the event in an emotionally costly and potentially very risky endeavor, resulting in an improvised ritual to achieve as acceptable a death as possible to restore some form of dignity against all odds. To conclude, archeology, span and its engagement with materiality and material culture and with the materialized traces of human action allows us to look into the deep past, but also into ourselves to explore the lived experience of human culture. With a focus on how people in very concrete terms handle the body of their dead, we uncover a silent grammar that makes peace with death as a foundational step in being able to return to life. Without it, our grief and trauma goes unresolved. By handling the dead with dignity, by creating a good death, we do not stop or conquer death. That would be silly. But more importantly, we manage to live with it. Thank you. Should I take the questions directly? or? Okay. Sorry, I'm Rüdiger Zill from the Einstein Forum and I have the pleasure to chair the morning session. Uh, yes, Susan, first. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one, one, one word, please. We have two uh, separate audiences. I remind you what. Uh, Misha already mentioned, um, there are questions from outside, from the Zoom, and uh, you take care of it. Okay, fine. So, we, uh, but first of all, uh, the questions from here, from Susan. So, um, I want to thank you for a terrific lecture. And um, I should say, as one of the colleagues who Misha politely called squeamish, I'm not sure that it's about that, uh, who was um, not so 
enthralled about the idea of this conference. The first two lectures have definitely changed my mind. Um, since your work is, I mean, you think across so many different cultures and also times, have you ever thought about the degree to which the treatment of dead bodies correlates or doesn't correlate with beliefs about the afterlife? You, it, what you said about how it relates to us and the function it does for those left behind was extremely interesting. But what about beliefs about what are happening, what is happening to? I, I, I believe that there is a connection there, of, of course. I think it has to be. My, my challenge was always because when I was developing my theoretical approaches, uh, I was working with, um, with 7,000 year old people. And so I, I, I would have to be incredibly um, aware of the fact that uh, I can't know. Uh, but I, so my, what their belief system was, what their, what their ideas were about the afterlife. But I started from the basics to think about like, okay, but what can I see? And what does that seem to indicate? And why I use a lot of what I imagine to be amazing mythological depth and stories telling and, and assumptions and, 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 and beliefs of, around what those buried people in the Stone Age for believed happened after death. Uh, I, I try to, I, I ask myself, okay, what can I, what, what do I, what, what do I see? And so uh, that's where I, I, I came into focusing on these observations of like, well, it seems like they believe that the individuals continue in some way after death, that individuality or their bodily integrity is central, um, that uh, uh, individuals are uh, passing into the next uh, world. We, as archaeologists, we also tend to see things kind of in the rear view mirror, we know what comes next, right? So we know that with the Neolithic comes the collective burials, comes the fragmentation of the individual, come the, these uh, uh, burial chambers that compound uh, lots of people that get commingled and so on, uh, which uh, could indicate a more collective uh, idea of ancestorship or something. But I believe that there are, of course, there. It, when people carry out mortuary rituals, they have ideas about what happens next. The question is, do they have the same idea? I mean, if we are a hardcore practice theorists, we would say that they might have different ideas about it, but the important thing is that they agree on how to handle the dead. And what does that say in terms of very basic, um, non-negotiable ideas? Uh, but as a prehistoric archeologist, I. I don't want to say that it is uninteresting that there are beliefs about the afterlife. I just have to be humble about the fact that I can't, I can't, I can't reach that level, unfortunately. But we know, of course, through ethnography that hunter-gatherers will have sophisticated mythological um, structures on where death would fit in. Yeah, there is a limit there. Misha. Thanks. Thanks for an amazing uh, lecture. And I, I admit that I've never lost my kind of childlike admiration of archaeologists. And it's not often that I get to, you know, talk to a real life archaeologist. So I have lots of questions. But what what really um, intrigues me is whether there is a productive dialogue going on between archaeology and especially the archaeology of, of burial and people working on more recent periods, but also more ancient periods. And what I mean is, on the one hand, forensic anthropologists who study um, the victims of you know, recent mass murder. And we know that Argentina, for example, um, has developed an amazing array of, of methods that were then even exported to other countries. Um, and, and adapted there. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, methodologically, but also in terms of conceptualization, uh, archaeologists working on more distant periods of the past have learned anything uh, from, from forensic anthropology and whether there's kind of a dialogue going on there. But then also I'm wondering whether there is any um, conversation going on with the field of paleontology, 
And one of the reasons why I'm asking this is that um, you know, we, we have all um, by now uh, said some words about you know, the sort of the ethical difficulty of showing human remains and working with human remains, etc. Um, whereas people who work with the remains of other animals never seem to be confronted with these kinds of questions. We had a talk earlier this week uh, by a historian who studies the mass killing of fur seals in the North Pacific since the 18th and 19th centuries, um, which involved, you know, really the, the extermination of millions of individuals of that species, um, many of them just left to rot, uh, and others turned into clothes for, you know, humans all around the world. Um, and I'm wondering whether you know, there's any kind of connection either on the, the methodological level or also on the question of you know, the, the ethics, the ethical questions that might be involved in thinking about the remains of animals of other species. Thank you. Uh, so first to address the question about forensics. Uh, yes, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, work uh, between, uh, well, archaeologists working across these fields. Uh, and, and when you take a field like uh, archaeology of death, uh, you, you'll, you'll see a lot of kind of uh, chronological movement of people working across period, because what we're interested in are these kind of like theoretical and sometimes also methodological um, connections, and also, of course, with uh, with uh, cultural anthropology, with uh, sociology, with philosophy, and so on. Forensics, in particular, um, I think that uh, yes, uh, and th there, uh, the people who do really interesting work in that regard are the the the, the, the rarer breed of forensic uh, uh, anthropologists who are also interested in theory. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I, I have a <clears throat> postdoc, Haley Mickelberg who does experimentation uh, with, uh, with uh, human bodies at one of these experimental facilities in Texas. And one of her experiments is, is about uh, mass burial right now. But she, for example, has really explored her own experiences of engaging with the dead body in different stages of decomposition to uh, kind of highlight the sensory experiences of people in the past, or as, as a way in to at least reflect on it. So you can go from, of course, methodological development, like she does for the, the Mass Graves Project, which is about providing tools for mass grave investigations. Uh, but from those experiences, uh, she's also able to uh, retrieve uh, insights that she can use in other aspects of uh, the archaeology of death that, in this case, had to do with sensory experiences of, of, of handling the dead body. So there is definitely a lot of work going on there. Um, and um, uh, with uh, paleontology, I think it's really interesting to think about how mortuary, uh, like mortuary ritual is often uh, kind of inserted as one of the main uh, evidences for, lines of evidence for establishing when we become human. Uh, and uh, of course, animals, uh, non-human animals, also have ritual-like uh, behaviors around death. So there is a whole discussion there that I think is, is increasingly being um, uh, the boundaries kind of breaking down a little bit. Uh, but in terms of uh, human evolution, to start there, with that, that part of the question, um, I think it is really interesting to see how how we use. Um, intentional burial and all that comes with it in terms of hum, hum, human um, uh, capacity of, of, of symbolic and, and, and abstract thinking and um, the emotional and, and, and uh, processes that are going on, um, beliefs about the afterlife. Uh, we use that to kind of track when we become human. Uh, and yet at the same time, um, there is a lot of, I think a lot of what you brought up in terms of human, non-human animal status 
enters into that debate really quickly. Well, surely they were not able to. Well, they probably just dropped their dead down that shaft, or you know, uh, they just you know. So I think that uh, that 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 hierarchy that you are addressing shows in that debate. Uh, I I think there are people working on. Um, there is a lot more work right now on um, post-humanist archaeology and on uh, the relationship between animals and humans, uh, uh, but that tends to be addressed more in a theoretical and interpretative way and maybe not so much in the practical way in terms of like how do we, how do we treat these remains, for example, if that's what you are thinking about in terms of kind of like just the practice of the profession. Um, animal bones are treated very differently from human bones in uh, archaeological contexts. Uh, so I think that there's lots of uh, frontiers there to be yet to be explored. I don't, so I don't have a really good example of, of that. Could be my own ignorance, though. Um, are there any questions from outer space, Misha? Or, uh, OK, uh, I have a question myself. So um, when you told us about uh, Germanicus at the mm -hmm. very, very what, six years later, was it? Uh, yeah, six, allegedly, yeah. 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 Uh. A very different example came to my, comes mm -hmm. to my mind, and that is the, the Estonia, the, the ferry at the yeah. Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, at one point the uh, government decided that they don't want to go down there, or they mm -hmm. could, couldn't do that probably tech, for technical reasons. Mm -hmm to rescue the, the corpses, so they just declared the, the whole place as a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Are there any, or were there any discussions about that, whether this is right or not? A lot wrong? of discussion, yeah, actually. Probably, yes. It's a great example, because that was a national trauma in Sweden, because it was such mm -hmm. a, it was, it was the kind of catastrophe that hit uh, people in such interesting ways because these ferries would uh, be typical for taking groups of people. So they would take like the whole, I don't know, like the whole county administration of like one city or like a whole class or like a whole football team or like a whole choir or whatever. So people usually would travel in groups. And so when the, the, the ship uh, went down, uh, the impact was felt in uh, both in terms of that pretty much everybody knew somebody or knew somebody who knew somebody who had who had perished because we're not a big country in Sweden. Um, but in addition, there were these holes left in uh, in the society, like that tear in the social fabric got really big in some places because like, oh, all of their, I don't know, like this whole group of people was gone that, you know. Um, so first of all, it was a really, uh, significant trauma uh, in Sweden. And then in the debates that followed, uh, what, was really, what was really difficult was that you had uh, uh, relatives of people who had perished who, who wanted different things. Mm -hmm. So some of them wanted to retrieve the dead, and some of them did not want to retrieve the dead. And so there was a big discussion about that. Uh, and uh, so in terms of also thinking about how we sometimes homogenize calls in one uh, direction or another when it comes to this, it's, there, there were very different uh, uh, views about it. And, uh, and I think that um, the decision to declare it a, a um, cemetery at sea was, um, was uh, one that can be defended. Uh, I think, but I think that it's also one of those things where if you have like the, like if this was America, I would be like, we're gonna go in and we're gonna get everybody back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, and, and in this case, it was kind of like the opposite of that, which was kind of like, well, you know, uh, nature has its course. Do you really want to see what's left of your loved one? Maybe we better not talk so much about the state that they're gonna be in and so on. Um, so uh, there was a lot of debate. And I think that there's, it's still kind of, it's, it's resulted in an unresolved, it's, been, it's an unresolved issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that the fact that that was unresolved uh, probably also plays into the triggering of emotional 
um, responses to every new item that comes out about Estonia. Uh, for example, like uh, when there are, um, and why there can still be kind of conspiratorial thinking around it. Uh, I, think, I think that when you, when people have unre or ha with, with unresolved death or unresolved trauma like this, I think is a good breeding ground for distrust also. And I think that's what's happening with Estonia. Mm. There's no pl proper place to mourn for, for these deaths probably. So, or the, is the, there something on- There is a monument, on, monument. Uh, on land. Uh, and it, it, you know, and and I think that and and at sea the, the problem is more that it's been declared a gravesite, so nobody is supposed to be allowed to die there, but they do. Uh, so so it's not, it's hard to protect yeah. uh, burials uh, under those circumstances, especially when it is a site that also attracts this kind of uh, desire to find out what's what's if if there's something uh, mm -hmm. untoward about it. Uh, but I think this. Uh, the lack of um, the lack of um, empathy in the response to those who wanted the bodies retrieved on behalf of the Swedish state, I think, was a mistake because I think that that has uh, um, created uh, a distrust in the whole process of investigation of the mm -hmm. of the um, the events. Any other questions? Thank you very much for this question. Um, I would like to um, go forward and ask you uh, if, for instance, the situation with Estonia and lack of bodies somehow influences on your political discourse, uh, make it, I don't know, more nationalistic. Of course, mm. I'm thinking about this conspiracy theory, but I'm thinking mm. about the mood, the mood of lack, lack of bodies. And do you recognize anything in your social, but also political life, if there's any echo in a political life? Because this is something what we definitely recognize in Central Eastern Europe, in Poland, for instance. The lack of bodies immediately turns to a political, political mm. problem. Mm -hmm. And I am wondering if you have something similar, or rather it's more about the social mooring and it does not go into politics discourse. So body and politics yeah. in Poland are yeah. very, yeah. very much yeah. together, I, always I, like a phantasm. It's, it's really, really interesting. And, and then I'm thinking um, Estonia was one big tragic event. Um, and um, had we had more, of these that we could track the, we might be able to see different patterns. I also wonder with, um, because Estonia was in 90, 94. 94, okay, yeah. Um, if it happened today in our political climate today, that I believe is much more, um, where we have much more tendencies of um, uh, distrust uh, and uh, also a lot more uh, nationalist um, politics, for example, uh, in Sweden as well, uh, if it would have played out differently. Because right now, when I, when I, try, if I wreck my brain to try to see patterns, and I don't really see it, and because I think that the, 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 the victims were so weirdly spread out in all sorts of throughout kind of like Swedish society, different ages, different levels, different, but very much kind of like anchored in separate like municipalities and kind of like a local way. So there was no pattern there. But if you would have a situation where it was uh, one part of the country that was targeted by something or a particular group, uh, it would probably, it could have been co-opted in a different way because we have a much, we have a different political climate today. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's not possible, but in this case, I, I don't see it. Again. Um, so this is another question about prehistory, and um, it refers to 
David Wengrow's and David Graeber's um, mm -hmm. book, the, the Dawn of Everything, which I know you'll be discussing in, in detail in a few days. Um, so David Wengrow actually gave a, a talk about this book uh, early this year at the Einstein Forum, and um, I was I was absolutely amazed uh, in, in reading this book on, on many, many levels, but one of the things that uh, stayed with me is this idea that in the age before the advent of sort of hereditary kinship and the attendant inequalities, a lot of prehistoric societies tended to bury, as far as we know, not everyone systematically, but specifically with people with sort of bodily deformities and, you know, people who were, you know, dwarf-like stature, etc. Um, and they kind of weave a whole theory out of this about um, the idea that, um, you know, those were the people with kind of the special status that would then give rise to certain kinds of inequality, but there was no um, culture of like systematically burying everyone. It was always selective. And I'm just wondering what you, as another practicing uh, archaeologist, think of, of those kinds of interpretations. Not convinced. Not convinced. Not in the sense that, I mean, absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, especially not when we deal with the Paleolithic. Uh, when I look at the Mesolithic, uh, which is uh, these people that I have been working with, <clears throat> what we see is that uh, when archaeologists start to pay attention to burials that don't look what they like, what they thought that they should look like, uh, we see a huge variation in the mortuary practices. So we've gone from these images that I showed you today, which would be kind of iconic for what we thought that these people, what the burials looked like, to understanding that we have fragmentation of bodies, we have um, uh, crushing of bones, we have burning of bodies, we have all sorts of things going on that may not leave the same archaeological trace. Uh, and so uh, not only considering like the, the, the millennia that these periods are uh, spread out over, but also considering the post potential variation in how people handle their dead and what that would leave in terms of an archaeological trace. I do think that the record that we have is very extremely fragmented. And so to conclude that only extraordinary individuals or mostly extraordinary individuals would get a burial is problematic to me. I do like the highlighting of uh, care that these burials, that also they made that, that, that they, the point that is being made is that uh, it's not this idea of like oh, everybody who has a disability is uh, not surviving in this hunter-gatherer world. We have evidence of the contrary. We have people who have uh, healed wounds and, 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 and uh, long-lasting developed pathologies that they have lived with over time, which, which indicates to us that there is care and there is a social organization around these individuals that support them um, being uh, members of, of those communities. Um, but to, uh, but I, I am really careful. I'm really happy with that. I think that's good enough. Uh, I think that to go to uh, a situation where people with disabilities would be the ones that are, because that's been said uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, we, we, we have so few individuals that uh, any pattern that we try to s find is, is um, I mean, it's possible, but I, th I, th I, think, it's, I think it's more important to, 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 f to go to, a, to think about this as like, we get like a fragmented little glimpse into something that a group of people were doing, and we try to find the humanity in that. Um, some of that is these individuals with pathologies, and that tells us a lot about um, interpersonal relationships of care and support. Uh, but I don't think that they are the only ones that get better, because, because archaeology works this way. If you find something extraordinary, it gets a lot of attention. But everything that's more kind of like, you know, it's just like business as usual. It's like, it's not that important. And I really like business as usual, because I think that business as usual are the regular people that try to make sense, like try to just live. And so these unextraordinary patterns are the things that matters the most to people. And so I really want to. Uh, 
kind of defend our focus on that instead of going for the exceptional all the time. Mm. Okay, now the non-exceptional is a coffee break. We, I think we should have a coffee break, uh, but it's because our next uh, talk will be on Zoom and we need a little technical break as well. So coffee is outside, please help yourself and see you later in five minutes.